to the introduction of our guest speaker. Our second speaker for this year has also been an instrument of Goddess Saraswati. Dr. Shashan Shah's family first came into Swami's fold in 1965 when his grandmother first visited Prashanti Nilayam. Brother Shashan joined Sri Satisai Institute of Higher Learning for postgraduate studies and has received MBA, MPhil, and PhD in corporate stakeholder management. He has received top honors and awards as a student for his academic achievement. There are too many to name, but I will cite a few ones, such as Association of Indian Management Scholars International Outstanding Doctoral Management Student Award, Governor's Gold Medal from Harman himself, and President of India Gold Medal. He has published over 70 research-based papers and case studies in reputed national and international journals and conferences. And he has co-authored four books and two monographs. He's well known and is well respected in the field of business ethics, value-based management, and education. Currently, he's engaged in postdoctoral work at the invitation of Harvard University as a Harvard scholar. Before coming to the U.S., Sashan served as the chief editor and coordinator of the Sri Satya Sai University's publication division. He compiled and edited over 30 books on the messages of our Bhagwan. Some of these include the My Dear Students series, Students with Sai Conversation series, and Sri Satya Sai Dikvajam series of books. Now, many of the, these books are available at our bookstore right here, so in case you want to check them out later on today. Sashank has also been the main ideator behind the Satya Sai with student blog, which sends out regular emails every week. And anybody is, uh, you know, can subscribe to this. If you are interested, do let us know and we will share that uh, information with you. Between 2002 and 2010, Shashank was blessed by Swami to address large gatherings over 25 times in the Divine Presence all over the country. And today, we are blessed to have him among, amongst us to share his experiences of Divine Love. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Sikhan. Offering our loving pranams at the Divine Lotus Feet of our most beloved Bhagwan. My sidearms to all the brothers and sisters and elders who gathered here this Sunday morning on the Memorial Day weekend, which is the most one of the most looked forward to weekends for enjoying ourselves. And it is we who are blessed to enjoy the real sense of the term because we've gathered here to experience and share the joy that Bhagwan wishes to confer on all of us. So my greetings to you for having made it here, for having been blessed to be a part of this retreat which is the 40th anniversary of the Mid-Atlantic Region Retreats. I wish to start by sharing that we are on the cusp of two very important days in Bhagwan's avataric life. I don't know whether you would have noted that in the middle of all the work that we are doing here, but I thought we'd share that today and then start the talk. So yesterday, 23rd of May, marked the platinum jubilee of the day when Bhagwan first declared to his father in that small house at Puttaparthi that he is Sai Baba. It's 75 years back on this very day in Puttaparthi. And tomorrow, 25th of May, in the year 1947, Bhagwan wrote that very historic letter to his brother Seshamaraju. Chalking out in that letter before Seshamaraju and the 
entire world the vision statement of this avatar. He put forth three very, very distinct points and I wish to share that because they have a very important bearing on the Satasai Seva organization whose golden jubilee we are celebrating this year. And what are those three important points that Swami shared in that letter? It's always good to use the original language, so I will mention them in Telugu and then translate them. So Swami said to Seshamaraju, who was concerned that the growing popularity of the little Satya may in turn become harmful for him. So Swami reassured him by sharing with him who he truly was and what he had come to do. So in that letter, Swami says, Akila Mahanagulaku Ananda Munagurchi Rakshinchu Chuntate Dikshanaku. It is a vow that I have to ensure life full of ananda, full of joy for all mankind. Second one, be the sadhalakaina, penuvadha tuliginche, lemini bhapate premanaku. I have a task which gives me a lot of joy and that is to remove the sufferings of the poorest of the poor. The third one, Swami said, Sanmargamuna Vedi, Charinchu Varala, Chei Patti Kaparte Vratamunaku. For those who have left the path of righteousness, it is my job, my duty to hold them by their hand and bring them back onto the path of righteousness. And then Swami added one very important point. I have a unique definition of devotion. Those devoted to me need to accept victory and defeat pleasure and pain with equanimity. Today as we celebrate the golden jubilee of the Satasai Seva organization and we wish to plan what the future of this organization is, we need to try and benchmark our long term objectives with the clear cut mission statement that Swami has made for himself. So, if we wish to know whether a particular activity that we are undertaking is in alignment with Swami wants, if we are doing any activity at the center level, state level, country level or at the global level is in alignment with what Swami wants, then we need to see whether it fits any one of these three criteria which Swami identified for himself in 1947. Because the Satyasai Seva organization is a part of Sri Satyasai. It is a subset of Sri Satyasai. What Sri Satyasai built to do is what the organization should continue to do forever and ever as his mission. We now move to the next part. As the, the region president said yesterday, we are celebrating the nine decades of the avatar hood. We are celebrating the 90 years of Swami's life. And so it is important that we recapitulate this life. We try and see what this life encompassed, what was achieved in a span of 85 years, which usually takes 8.5 centuries to achieve. And why am I saying that? Because we will know as we proceed. So once to Sri Brahmananda Panda, uh, one of the senior devotees from Orisha, Swami shared the whole life that he would lead and the major divisions of time that he would accomplish in his lifetime. And he divided that into six distinct phases. So the first phase is that of Leela. Swami said to Brahmananda Panda, the government of India has five year plans. I have 16 year plans because I wish to accomplish a little more than what the government does. And so he said, the first phase is that of Leela. What is Leela? Divine play. Divine play is what the avatar usually blesses his parents, his immediate family and those people who are blessed to be in his close proximity when he is in the childhood form. So from the child, from the time he was born, the time he grew up, he went to school, he had friends, he did all of what we usually do and gave so much of joy. But we have read in the Satyam Shrim Sundaram, there is so much that Swami accomplished in those 16 years while he was busy giving joy to his family and friends, there was so much more he was silently doing for the world and I will share that in some time. The next phase is that of Mahima, Divine Glory. Swami established his mission when he declared in 1940 that his work is calling him and he needs to move on from the family bondage 
and start the work for his devotees. And there has been no pausing even for a second thereafter for the remaining 70 years of Bhagwan's life. We see miracle after miracle, we see divine event after divine event that Swami unfolded, especially in the second phase of life. He went to all the major pilgrimage centers and recharged them, whether it is in to Badri in the north or Dwarka and Somnath in the west or it is as down south as Kanyakumari. Every religious pilgrimage place that Swami visited, he surcharged with some miracle or event. Whether it is materializing the Atma Lingam in Badri, whether it is materializing the Jyotir Lingam in Somana, whether it is materializing the idol of Krishna, the golden idol of Krishna from the sands of Dwarika, or it is materializing a beautiful Mangal Sutra for Rukmini at Pandarpur, or it is having those uh, three, those 108 beads, the pearls which were offered by the three oceans to Swami's feet in Kodai Kanan. Every moment was full of divine glory. And how can we forget that day of 3rd July, 6th July 1963, when he took upon himself the paralysis which he had said he would suffer, cerebral thrombosis, four heart attacks, all of that in one single week. Dr. Prasanna Sinha Rao, the assistant director of medicine from Mysore, came to examine Swami and said, it is unfortunate that such a glorious life may come to an end soon. Little did he know that this was just a short break that Swami had taken to get back with much more vigor. And we all know the Guru Purnima of 1963 when Swami sprinkled water on himself and then he was back to his divine form and thundered about his mission and the true form that he is of Shiva and Shakti. The third phase is that of Upadesha, the divine message. And that started in 1958, the third 16th year, when on Shivratri day, Swami started the Sanatan Sarathi magazine and declared that the Sanatan Sarathi will now go to all the corners of the world with Satya, Dharma, Shanti and Prema as its foot soldiers and communicate the message of the Lord to one and all. Swami travelled 300,000 kilometers across the length and breadth of India communicating the message of this avatar. Whether it is the peasants and the rural men in the hinterland of Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh or Tamil Nadu, whether it is the scientists at the Baba Atomic Research Centre, whether it is the medical experts during international conferences on medicine, whether it is the politicians, the prime ministers and presidents in Delhi, or whether it is the business managers and heads of trade organizations at the Indian Merchants Chamber in Bombay, Bhagwan communicated his message to one and all, suited, dovetailed, tailor-made to every stakeholder who needed that message for practicing in their daily life to make their life more purposeful and more useful. The fourth stage is the stage of Vidya. Bhagwan established in this stage all the educational institutions that today are beacon lights to the field of education. Whether it is the colleges at Anandpur, Prashantinilam and Vrindavan, whether it is the university at Puttaparthi, whether it is the Barvikas program or the SSC program across the world, and whether it is the wonderful Indian summer courses in spirituality and culture which Swami himself conducted, these were all efforts from Swami's side to redefine education and bring it back to its pristine glory as was envisaged in the Gurukul system of the year, where education was a means for a more fulfilling life. The end of education was character and not getting a job which would give you money to lead a comfortable life. Bhagwan redefined education and that is what we see successfully happening across the world. We have 100 Sathasai schools in India alone and 41 of them in 26 countries of the world. And we have thousands and thousands of students passing out from the portals of these institutions and becoming examples of Bhagwan's message of what good human beings and citizens ought to be. Then comes the fifth stage of the avataric life, the stage of Vaidya, of health care. And this commenced in 1990. And Swami declared 
We know of that discourse during the birthday celebrations when Swami said that the field of education has today become a field of commercial practices. You have doctors doing things to earn money, you have paramedical staff doing things to earn money and Swami said the rich can go to America and get their heart surgeries done. But what about the poor? Who will take care of them? Is death the only eventuality if you can't afford health care? No, no, no. Health care is the gift of God. Because Vaidyo Narayana Hari, the true doctor is God himself. And so Swami established the first super speciality hospital of the world which gives medical care absolutely free of cost. It is known as a hospital without a billing counter. And every committee which comes there wishes to go around seeing where the billing counter is. But they don't find a billing counter unlike other hospitals where you first deposit money. In India, you need to first deposit money, 50,000, 1 lakh rupees deposit. Only then you can enter. Even if you have an emergency, you first need to give that money and then gain admission. And in the western countries, you have to show your insurance policy. Are you insured? What kind of Medicare do you have? Only if you have Medicare, we will give you health care. Otherwise, you can leave. So that's the kind of healthcare situation the world is unfortunately facing. And Swami attempted to redefine it. And what an attempt it was in the last quarter century from 1990 to 2015. The Satasai Medical Institutions has done 2.5 million outpatient cases and over 200,000 surgeries. by a single trust only for healthcare. Brother Ravi Marivala who worked there for almost a dozen years would be able to give more insights into how these healthcare institutions actually function and what kind of instructions Bhagwan had given so that they truly serve their purpose. Swami had said one thing very important. He said the doctor is only doing the operation. It is God who is healing. And a patient is not a bed number. The patient is the body, mind and soul. And the health care which these institutions would give will be catering to all the three. It will be holistic health care. And in this context, someone mentioned to Swami. Swami said, they said, Swami, why don't we give health care in the cross-subsidization model? There is this cross-subsidization model, which is a very good model, management model, where the rich pay and the poor don't. And you get the money set off so that if the, the, those who don't have the resources benefit. Swami said, do you think I don't have that idea in my mind? I am not giving free health care because the rich can afford it and the poor can't afford it. I am giving free health care and free education because education and health care are not commodities to be traded. They are divine gifts which are from God and the teacher and the doctor is only a means. Only a means to communicate and deliver that and not charge anything. Education is not the one which is mugged from the books and delivered to the classroom. Healthcare is not the one which is delivered by doing some surgeries. It is the gift of God which is catering to the mind and the body and hence it has to be given free of cost. This is the underlying meaning when Swami time and again highlighted the need for giving this free. They are not traded. They should not be traded. The second part of Vaidya was water. We always wonder how water has to, what, what water has to do with healthcare. Water is the basis of healthcare. Sanitation, drinking water. If these two are available, health is half taken care of. And between, between 1994 and 2006, in a dozen years, Swami provided drinking water supply in three states of India through four water projects benefiting over 20 million citizens of India with an outlay of over 700 crores and doing what the government of India and the government of Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu and now even Telangana could not do for half a century. The district of Anandpur is the most parched district of the country after the desert region of Rajasthan. And governments after governments attempted 
to solve that problem, but nothing was done. And in a matter of 18 months, Swami provided drinking water supply to 700 villages. Few of us don't know. Why am I sharing this? We all know Swami's life, but we need to know it more clearly so that we can share it with equal conviction to people outside. And I will come to that point a little later. Few of us know that the Anandpur Drinking Water Supply Project is the largest project outside the government agencies anywhere in the world which was done for providing drinking water and it was ranked among the top 10 public-private partnership projects satisfying the Millennium Development Goals at the World Water Forum at Osaka and Mexico between 2005 and 2010. And a case study has been done on the Anandpur Water Supply Project by the School of Public Policy in the National University of Singapore. In 12 years, Swami provided drinking water supply to a population which is equivalent to the population of a few countries in Europe. That was the mission of Vaidya. And then comes the last phase of life and that Swami said would be the establishment of the Sanatana Dharma. Sanatana Dharma is not a religion. The word Hinduism has been enforced on India by the foreign invaders. Those who are on the other side of Sindhu, the Indus River, are Hindus. And that's how the word Hindu came into place. India never had any religion. It always had a way of life. And that way of life was called Sanatana Dharma, the eternal way of living, which has been in existence since times immemorial. And this started in 2006 with the Atirudra Mahayagnya. And you see year after year, year after year, Swami performing so many, many aspects of the Sanatana Dharma in Vishantinilyam in His physical presence to re-establish the Sanatana Dharma. The Vedam chanting which started with the college students for an apparent Vice Chancellor's Conference. You may not know actually the Vedam chanting started because the Vice Chancellor's Conference was in the offing. And Swami said, I want boys to chant Vedam for that conference. Usually outside people would want that in a vice chancellor's conference. Vice chancellor is the equivalent of the president of the university in US. In India, it's the vice chancellor. People would like to share the latest scientific achievements and publications when you have such a conference. Swami said, I want the boys and girls to chant Vedam. What apparently started with chanting of Vedam for a conference has eventually become a movement of studying, reading, reciting and practicing the Vedas. And this is not a by chance event. In 1960, there was a French scholar by the name Valestine who had come to Prashantinilayam. And in the interview room, he held Swami's hand and said, Swami, the Vedic wisdom is fast declining. This is the French scholar. The Vedic wisdom is fast declining. And this is documented in the Satyam Shum Sundaram volume 1. You may wish to see that. The Vedic wisdom is fast declining and you must do something in order that this ancient knowledge which has survived the longest civilization of the world. The Bharatiya civilization is the only surviving civilization of the world. The Mayan civilization, the Greek civilization, the Roman civilization, the Atlantic civilization are all part of history. But the Indian civilization, as Bhagwan has always said, has got deep roots, the others too have. But what Swami wanted to highlight is the depth of the scriptures which Bhagwan always wanted us to study, which are universal in nature, which are beyond religions, caste and climes, which are meant for the welfare of all mankind. He promised Palestine, he said, the Vedic wisdom would be established across the world and you will see it happen in your own lifetime. I will ensure that that happens. What he promised in 1960 was started in 2006 in a very big way. And today we have young children from U.S., from Trinidad and Tobago, from Finland, from Russia, from Poland, from Japan, from Australia, from the Middle East, chanting the Vedas with such ease and comfort. The Vedas have three parts, the Brahmanas, the Aranyakas and the Upanishads. What do they symbolize? They symbolize the path of karma, which is work, the path of upasana, which is worship, and the path of jnana, which is wisdom. And this Swami wanted to establish even as a part of the organization's functioning. 
And as the region president just announced, there are three wings in the organization. Karma, service, devotion, which is upasana, and education, which is jnana. Our organization is very closely linked with the larger message of Vedic wisdom. And Bhagwan wanted us to understand the purport behind each of these scriptures. So that is what the avataric life encompassed. But was this the mission of Swami? We always try and equate the projects that Swami did as his mission. Bhagwan established three important institutions. Bhagwan's organization is present in 125 countries. There are 600,000 volunteers in India alone and an equal number outside. Real, real fantastic statistics from any worldly point. Nobody can beat it. In, in accepting that this is really, really a unique and one of its kind organization. But is that what Bhagwan's mission is all about? I think Swami in his own lifetime communicated that it isn't. The family relations which he sustained for 16 years or 14 years of his life, he just gave it up one fine day when he lost the golden collar pin. We've read that poem when Swami says, the pin was lost at Hampi and with it went the attachment towards the family. The miracles, the Mahima which we all talk about. So many many books have been written on Swami's miracles and Swami's divine Mahimas and glory. Swami used to say, my divine glory and my miracles are equivalent to the mosquito on the back of an elephant. And he just said, my miracles are my visiting cards. What is the meaning of that? I always used to wonder, we parrot these words of Swami very often. My miracles are my visiting cards. So we can say, Swami said his miracles are his visiting cards. But what is the meaning of that? The meaning of that is that I, I perform miracles for you only to introduce myself to you. Just as you introduce yourself to someone using a visiting card. Is there anyone in this hall who has given his visiting card to the same person twice? Please raise your hands. But what we want Bhagawan to do? We want Bhagawan to give us his visiting card every time. Every time Bhagawan should give visiting card. If Bhagawan doesn't give visiting card, we will go elsewhere. But we want visiting cards. We will go to this house for visiting card, we will go to that house for visiting card, but we want visiting card. The problem is after having known him, we should delve into him and not just get to know who he is again and again through the visiting card. So that is the meaning of my miracles are my visiting cards. And then we come to the social welfare projects. Was Bhagwan a social worker? Was Swami a reformer? Was Swami a visionary? Was Swami a philosopher? Yes, he was. He was all of that, but not only that. Swami established these institutions for a very important purpose, or rather for two purposes. The first purpose was to fulfill the promise He gave to His mother. We all know about it, Swami has spoken about it so many, many times. What is the responsibility of a son towards his mother? Swami showed that all his life. It doesn't end when you finish your 18 years like in this country and move out to lead an independent life and visit parents on Mother's Day and Father's Day. Every day is Mother's Day and every day is Father's Day because our mothers and fathers are thinking of us every day. So we need to think of them every single day. So through his last breath, and his last year, Bhagwan was committed to the vision and prayers of Mother Ishwarama in the form of these three projects. These three projects also served an important purpose that how social welfare institutions should be envisioned, implemented, executed and then the impact analyzed. Swami never analyzed impact and I am sure those who have worked in Swami's institutions in, will share in terms of numbers. How many operations did we do? How many boys got degrees this year? How many people benefited from the water supply project? No. He was not interested in numbers. He was interested in quality. And then he was interested in benefit in terms of transformation. Is it transforming their lives? Is it good for them? Is it making them more responsible, more useful, more good human beings? Then the purpose of that project is accomplished. So I think these things were only an indicative measure. 
1950, he started the ashram and showed how the ashram should, how a good ashram should be run for 60 years. In 1960, he established the seva organization and showed for 50 years how a seva organization should be run. In 1970s, he started the trust and showed how a good socio-spiritual trust should be run. In the 1980s, he started the educational institutions. And for 30 years, he showed how educational institutions should be run. In the 1990s, he started the medical institutions and showed how exemplary tertiary care medical institutions should be run. He was only showing us what we have to do. We have this common question, how should we run Swami's institutions? We can only be called blind if we have not seen Swami run them for the last 60 years and just follow his footsteps and examples and execute it. So he did all of this only to set an example. Then what is Swami's mission? Swami's mission is just a four-lettered word. The word based on which this year is dedicated and that word is Love, 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 love and love alone. In an interview to journalists in 1970s, somebody asked Swami, what is your modus operandi? What is your methodology? They were asking Swami of transformation. Swami said, I have only one methodology. Love is my methodology and love is my merchandise. Love is my ornament and love is my armament. I know only one path and that is the path of love. We don't understand what this love is, but if you read the work of Dr. Frank Baranowski, who was an aura expert, a regression therapist, and who used extensively the Kirlian photography technique to study what individual auras are all about, we will understand what Bhagwan's love is all about. You would have read how Dr. Baranowski studied Swami's aura and said that typically an individual's aura is about four to six feet. We all have auras surrounding us and those auras are indicative of the genuine values or the vices that we possess, right? And that's why the realized souls are able to see you and find your limitations, right? And your virtues. So those auras are indicative of what we stand for. The enlightened beings, the realized individuals have bigger auras, 15 feet, 20 feet, and that's why we feel so very nice when we go into the presence of a sage, a rishi, an enlightened being. But he said Swami's aura, when he saw him on the top of the old bungalow at Vrindavan, was not 5 feet or 6 feet of a normal human being, was not 20 feet of an enlightened being. He said, I couldn't see the end of the aura. It was extending all the way to the horizon and there was no end to the aura. It was covering every single individual in that compound. And the aura was of pink color, which symbolizes love. And there were streaks of silver and golden, which are indicative of divinity. And he said that I can give Baba only one descriptive phrase. He said that Baba is what he claims himself to be, love walking on two feet. The most distinguishing feature of an avatar is love. We always misunderstand. Yesterday, Dr. Anorim shared about avatar. He said, I don't know what an avatar is, but I'm slowly understanding over the last 20 years. What is an avatar? We always mix up avatars from Siddha Purushas. Avatars are not understood through siddhis, through omniscience, through materializations. That is possible to get through penance and tapas. And we have seen in the scriptures, when some king goes to a sage, he closes his eyes and he is able to envision the past and the future of that individual and say what he did yesterday or what he would get in the future. You will get a son, you will win this battle, you will do this, you will do that. They could do it. We have so many examples of Siddhis where you can materialize things. In fact, in the Hanuman Chalisa, we, we, we extol Hanuman. How many of you all have heard Hanuman Chalisa? I'm sure a lot of you would have. Yes, a lot of you would have had. In that, there is a verse. Ashta Siddhi Navanidhi Ke Tata. Hanuman can confer the Ashta Siddhis and the Navanidhis. Hanuman who claimed himself to be the servant of the Lord Rama, 
it is extolled that he can confer astasiddhis. What are the astasiddhis? It is necessary to know so that we have greater cl clarity about the avatar. There are ashta, eight siddhis. Ashta means eight. Eight siddhis. Anade, anima. Ability to reduce one size. Mahima. Ability to increase one size. Garima. Ability to increase one's weight. Laghima. Ability to become lighter than the lightest. Prapti. Ability to obtain anything. Prakamya. Ability to acquire anything desired. Ishatva. Mastery over creation. And Vashitva having control over things. All of this can be got by anybody who undertakes penance for these purposes. And that's why Sri Ramakrishna Paramahansa always warned that as you progress on the spiritual path, you will see these Siddhis manifesting in you. But don't get carried away by the Siddhis because they will divert your attention. Be focused on the goal of attaining God Himself. So these Siddhis are not what an avatar is about and that's why Swami said in that landmark discourse in 1968 These are not Siddhis which Ramakrishna Paramahansa spoke about I am not a Siddha Purusha I am the one who confers Siddhis on Siddha Purusha because I am the end of their yoga That is what an avatar is all about What is the most overpowering feature of the avatar is his overwhelming presence and his all encompassing love Vasishtha, Balamiki, Vyasa, Vishwamitra, Garga, all of these possessed all of these Siddhis. They were capable of doing all of this. They were the authors of Mahabharata and Ramayana. Sitting in their hermitage, they could envision the battle, the past and the future and write about it. But what did they yearn? Not for the Siddhis. They yearned for the proximity of the avatar. They prayed that when the avatar is born, we should live in his presence. Because it is only the avatar who can confer the experience of love. And that love is the only distinguishing feature of the avatar. No doubt, when Professor V.K. Goka asked Swami, Professor V.K. Goka was a great scholar. Preeti just described the experience of Professor V.K. Goka in terms of his Yesterday she spoke about it, about his scholarship. He was the Gnan Peet Award winner and the Vice Chancellor of the Bangalore University, a very, very accomplished Kannada poet and also earlier an ardent devotee of Sri Aurobindo of Pondicherry. He once wanted to know after coming to Swami, what is the difference between Swami and Sri Aurobindo? And this is documented in one of the books on Bhagwan. He asked Swami, Swami, what is the difference between you and Aurobindo? Swami said, Aurobindo was Vyaktinatha. He was the master of his disciples. I am Lokanatha. I am the master of all the worlds. That is the distinguishing feature of an avatar. No doubt, Sri Ramana Maharshi sent some of his disciples to go and sit in Bhagavan's presence in the late 1940s in the Path Mandiram and benefit from the bhajan sessions in progress. No doubt, Dada Vaswani of the Sadhu Vaswani mission told one of our teachers at Prashanti Nilayam that you are blessed that while we are foot soldiers doing our work in our different missions, the Governor General of the Army of Spirituality resides in Puttaparthi. No doubt, Sri Chandrasekhar and the Saraswati, the Mahaparyava of Kanchi, told select devotees that go to Puttaparthi because Kanchi Kamakshi resides there in flesh and blood. That is what Avatar is all about. And we need to understand this glory of the Avatar. We need to understand this love of the Avatar. And that is what I am going to do now. Share with you different facets of the Avataric life. We have four different human values which we always talk about, Satya, Dharma, Shanti, Prema, Ahimsa, right? In that, love is the one which Bhagawan has used to define the other four. How has Swami defined that? Swami has said, love as thought is Satya, truth. Love as action is Dharma, 
right conduct. Love as feeling is shanti, peace. And love as understanding is ahimsa, non-violence. These four human values can be practiced only through the means of love. And hence it is very important for us to understand what true love means and then analyze it and then practice it. That is what we need to make a constant endeavor towards. And we will attempt that today as we progress on the theme Love is the source, love is the path, and love is the goal. I have I've divided Swami's love into five distinct themes, and I will try and elaborate on each of them so that we understand each of these in a much better fashion. So first is the love of Swami for his family, his friends, and his immediate set of people who were blessed to be in his presence. We all know the story of how Sri Kondamaraju, Swami's grandfather, divided the family into two parts because the family had grown quite big and he divided the property into the two, between the two families and then he said, I want only one thing and he made the most wise decision we can ever make. He said, I want Satya. You give Satya to me and take all this other property. And so it happened, the two families got the property and the grandfather got the giver of the property. Swami so went with Srikandamaraju. And for the next half a decade, when he stayed with Srikandamaraju, Swami showed in action what true love for one's grandfather is. He is to take care of his daily requirements, he is to take care of his food, he is to cook food for his grandfather before going to school and wash the vessels and then rush to school and then come back and cook for the evening. And we have heard stories of how Swami used to talk about the rasam, which he used to make and used to attract people from different parts of the village because of the sheer aroma of that rasam, which also had a lot of medicinal properties. That is the love which we need to have towards our grandparents. We all have grandparents. How much of time do we give to their requirements? How much of love do we express to them? Bhagwan did that in ample measure. And that is an example which we can definitely emulate. Love as a brother. We all know how Swami was staying with his elder brother Seshamaraju in Uravakonda for his schooling. And there there was an acute shortage of water. In that acute shortage of water, the only available source of water was carrying those two, the, that stick with two pots on either side, walking to the source of water, coming back twice a day, thrice a day, every single day. Some of the neighbors told Swami, Swami, why are you doing this? This is not your job. You are here for studying. He was a student then. So they said, why are you doing this? Swami said, no, 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 this is my duty. This is my duty to the family of my brother. Because the brother has a small child. The wife is in the family way. And they don't have the time to do this work. So it is my duty as the younger brother of the household. The same thing Swami said 50 years later, when the Anantapur water supply project was completed. The people from the district of Anandpur came to Prashanti Nilayam to thank Swami for the water supply project and said, thank you Swami for giving us water. Swami, anybody else would have said, oh, you're welcome, anytime, it's my pleasure, my privilege. Swami didn't say that. Swami said, no, 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 you don't have to be thankful to me. I am thankful to you for giving me an opportunity of being of service to you. I am thankful to you for that and not only today, in the future also, if you need any help, please give me the opportunity to serve you. That is the example Swami set after doing service. Because service is an opportunity to benefit yourself, not the recipient. Because there are so many people who are receiving, but the very few who can give. If you analyze that, there are so many, many people in this world who are receiving. Very few people who are giving. And it is an opportunity for those who get to give because they have, have something to give. Whether it is money, whether it is talent, whether it is resources, whether it is help. And as Swami said, if you can't give anything, just give a smile. And that will be the best service that you can do. Because the other person will feel so much more good. Then we have Swami's role as a son. I just shared how the three projects that Swami undertook 
were for the fulfillment of his promise to Mother Ishwaram. I need to I want to highlight this point here about the duty of a son. We have we have uh, this uh, blood donation camp here by Red Cross. That was the announcement done. I'm sure a lot of you would have gone to donate blood. Yes or no? No. So I request the region president to make one more announcement after my talk so that they are inspired to go and donate blood. So when we donate blood, we feel so happy because we are giving something of ourselves to the other person. And when we receive blood, we, receive, we feel so much more grateful because that person has given us their blood, his blood or her blood, and we can lead a more healthy life. What about gratitude to that person who has nourished us with her blood for nine long months, day in and day out, thinking only of our welfare and undergoing unimaginable pain so that we can lead a very, very happy and comfortable life. That is the role of a mother in the life of every individual. And Swami was most exemplary in highlighting this role of the love that a son should show towards the mother all through his life. No doubt the Upanishads say the very first among all gods is mother. Matru Devo Bhava. Then Pitru Devo Bhava, father. Then Acharya Devo Bhava, teacher. Teacher is afterwards, before that father. But first is mother. That is the love, that is the respect, that is the duty we need to show towards our mother as Swami has shown in his own life. Swami says, if you cannot love your mother who is in front of you, Swami used to say Prataksha Daivam. Prataksha means visible, Daivam means God. I am using these Sanskrit words just to con communicate to you that it is very easy to understand. You get the direct meaning if you know the word and the translation. The translation you lose out some of the subtleties. So Pratyaksha Daiva means direct, visible God. Swami said, if you can't love and worship your own mother, who is Pratyaksha Daiva, the first God in front of you, how can you worship the Apratyaksha Daiva, the invisible God whom you are always trying to please? Swami said, if you want the mother of the universe to shower her grace on you, first earn the grace of the visible mother, which is in, who is in front of you. That is the golden ground to achieve the grace and love of the divine mind. And then comes a very important part, love for friends. We would have seen the Savadi Day discourse which was played by Radio Sai during the Aradhana Mahotsavam and in that Swami highlighted his relationship with Ramesh and Parish. Swami said how they always wanted to give gifts to Swami and Swami used to refuse saying that true friendship is heart to heart, love to love and not exchange of money or items or goods. And Swami always used to inspire them on that path. There's a very interesting incident which happened about how Swami always remembered his friends and fulfilled his friendship. There was this occasion of Dasara celebration in the Purachanda Auditorium. And there was distribution of uh, items for all the devotees. And Swami took one bag which, consist, which contained all those items which were being distributed and walked all the way to the rear end of the Purnachandra auditorium with the bag in his hand and I guess from Sanil Kumar following him towards the end of the hall. And there he went to one old man and gave it to him. And uh, Prof. Sanil Kumar was wondering that's why Swami took the trouble going from the stage all the way to the end. He said, Swami, why did you do it? You could have given it to me, I would have gone and given it. Why trouble yourself? Swami said, do you know who he is? Prof. Sanil Kumar said, no Swami. Swami said, he is Satya Narayana. He is also Satya Narayana. He is my school friend. And does not friendship demand that I give the gift from my own hand to my own school friend? That is why I have come all the way to the end of the hall to give me this gift. That is the love of friendship. It doesn't end when we separate, when we part ways at the end of four years. It doesn't end when we leave the dorm and move to an apartment. It doesn't end when we leave a town and move to another. True friendship is eternal. It is eternal because it helps each other on the path to God. And it helps each other experience that mutual love which is selfless. As Priti described the other day very well, love is selflessness. The second part she said, self is lovelessness. Here I just want to distinguish one thing 
that self which she spoke about is the small letter S, not the capital S. I hope we understand the difference between the two. The self which starts with the small S is the individual self, the ego. The, the self which starts with the capital S is the higher self. So when we say self is lovelessness, it is the self-centered attitude is devoid of love. And love is selflessness. Having no sense of selfishness in oneself, having total detachment and total lack of selfishness in our conduct. We move to the next constituency. And this is something which will be very dear to our young adults here. And of course, to the SSE children, but I know that their sports are going on. I hope these stories are shared with them someday. This is love of Swami for animals. We all heard and know and have seen the love of Swami for Sai Gita. Right? There's a very beautiful article which was written in Radio Sai about Swami's love for Sai Gita and how on various occasions Swami had blessed her with interactions and had done so much for her and she had done so, felt so much of love and devotion for Swami. It is difficult to believe that coming from an animal. You must read that particular article. Here I am going to share four distinct experiences of other species of animals and Swami's love for them and how they reciprocate. So first is the story of Minky the cat. Minky the cat from the town of Gohati in Assam. A group of devotees from Assam had come all the way to Prashantinilayam in November 1972 to celebrate birthday. And after the birthday celebrations were over, this group of devotees were taken into the bhajan hall by Swami and given an opportunity of interaction and uh, prasadam distribution. After the prasad, while the prasad mission was going on Swami's own hands, he came to this girl, her name was Lekhi. He came to her, gave her one handful of prasadam, Vibhuti prasadam. And then he gave her one more handful of prasadam, and then he told her in Hindi, Ye billi ke liye hai. <laughs> This is for the cat. Now, we won't understand why Swami said that. But I will tell you why Swami said that. And Lekhi herself was quite astonished. When she actually re recollected the incident, she realized what Swami's love for her cat was and what Swami's omniscience was. It seems six months before this event, there was a function in her house and a lot of uh, uh, guests had come and a lot of food was served on the table. And this cat jumped onto one of the plate and tried to grab a piece of food, a piece of uh, some item from that plate. And, and Lekhi, in her anger, took a stick and hit the cat with her own hand, with a stick. And that very moment, all the photos of Swami in her house fell down. And when she took the cat in her hand and tried to... Uh, she felt remorseful and she tried to pat the cat. And from the cat's body was emanating sweet, fragrant vibhuti. So this, this, this Lekhi at that time realized that Swami is indicating to her to love her cat. Six months later, Swami gave her vibhuti with her own hands and said, Ye billi ke liye hai. This is for the cat. That's the kind of love that Swami has for animals. They, not, they need not be near to Him, but they are all dear to Him. There's another story of Kuttan the dog in the Nilgiris. These are the names which, which are given popularly in India. So Kuttan the dog in Nilgiris was a village dog. He was very, very fierce dog because his job was to protect the village. So he used to keep barking at every stranger. So when Swami visited the village in May 1962, these people had tied the dog lest he should try and bark at Swami. And when Swami saw the dog, they said, he said, why have you tied the dog? Leave the dog open. They left the dog open and the dog was with so much of love following Swami wherever he was going. When Swami went and sat on the stage, this dog sat next to Swami. When Swami went to the kitchen to see the food, this dog followed Swami into the kitchen to see the food. And when the food was to be served, Swami said, first feed Kuttan, then feed food for all the other devotees. So as Swami directed, the food was given to this dog. And as soon as the food was given to the dog, the dog was sitting next to Swami and having his food. He finished his food and then put his head on Swami's feet and silently gave up his life. That is the love of Swami. 
we feel that Swami has gone to the Nilgiris to bless the devotees, no doubt. But he had also gone there for Kuttan the dog so that he can breathe his last. When he had served his village with so much of passion, protecting it from all the unknown people who wish to come there, he went and blessed the dog so that he can merge in him. The next story is of Horsley Hills in Madanapalli which Swami visited in 1960. It's a very famous hill station. And there, Swami had taken a, a group of devotees. I think Howard Murphett was also a part of that team. He's quoted about this in the Man of Miracles book as well. And after all the wonderful stay there was over, there was a water supply shortage there. So after everything was over, they were leaving. Swami paid all the people. By the way, for those who don't know, at the end of every trip which Swami hosts, He gives all the tips to all the people that have to be given, whether it is the washerman, the cook, or the barber, or the driver, or the gardener. He always used to tell the students when they used to accompany him to Kodaikanal, don't give any money to anybody. You have come with Swami. That is my job. So he gave all the kind of tokens of gratitude that he wanted to give. And then he told the party, just wait for a minute. I need to go somewhere. I'll come back soon. So Professor Kasturi, who was always inquisitive to know what Swami is doing, obviously, because he was his biographer. He was jolly well responsible for documenting Swami's life well. He followed Swami silently, even silently without Swami's knowledge. And he saw Swami going behind the bungalow. And there, Swami was putting his hand on the head of a buffalo. And Swami was telling him in Telugu, that buffalo in Telugu, as if the buffalo understands Telugu, but yes, the buffalo did understand Telugu because it was the language of God. He said to the buffalo, You have done great service. I am very happy. He materialized Vibhuti and applied the Vibhuti on the forehead of the buffalo just as Swami does for many of us. And again caressed his head with his hand and said, I am very, very happy. Professor Kasturi documents that I was never aware of this unique relationship that God has with every aspect of the creation. We think that the God, that the Prophet, the Avatar is for us. He is for everybody. We distinguish between one being and another. He doesn't. And that's the mistake his driver made. Swami's driver once when they are driving on the road, there was a snake. He saw a snake from a distance. And Swami was sitting behind. He saw from the rear view mirror. And Swami was closing his eyes and sitting behind. So he didn't want to break the, didn't want to apply the brakes. So he let the car go over the snake. After the, he reached the destination, Swami got down of the car, and the driver opened the door, and Swami came out. And as he was moving, moving forward, he saw tire marks on Swami's robe. So immediately the driver came back and asked, Swami, there are some some marks on your robe, like a patch like that. So Swami said, of course. Didn't you go over that snake on the road so that my sleep doesn't get disturbed? Who do you think resides in that snake? It is me who resides in that snake. So if you have troubled that snake for my sake, it is my responsibility to protect that snake's life so that it continues to live its existence. Did the snake pray to Swami? Was the snake a devotee? Was the buffalo a devotee? Was Binky a devotee? Was Kutan a devotee? None of them were devotees. But they were his children. Because God is the cosmic parent. You don't need to pray to him. You just need to love him. You need to you do your duty with all your heart. And that's what Swami has communicated to that. For who takes care of the frog in the crevice of a rock? Nobody goes there to feed it. Nobody goes there to supply water to it. It is God who takes care of all the creation. Ours is only an opportunity to serve whenever we come across any opportunity which can benefit man. We now move to the third section. And this is the love of Swami for his devotees. There are so many, many stories which have been written of love of Swami for his devotees. And I would like to quote a few so that we can reminisce that love that Swami had for his devotees. At the same time, we can take home a lesson which we can practice in our life. And I would like to share the story of Jogneshwar Gogoi from Assam. He was 
in Dharma Kshetra on a particular day, and this story is narrated by Professor Kasturi in his book Satya Sai Baba, God in Action. Jagdish Rukhogoy was in Dharma Kshetra, coincidentally he was retired and he was in Dharma Kshetra for Swami's Darshan incidentally because he was not a devotee. And there he was sitting somewhere in the last row and Swami came and interacted with him. I'll go back to Jogneshwar Gogoi's life and then tell you what Swami's interaction with him was. So Jogneshwar was in London during the World War II days. And there the Germans used this blitzkrieg technique where they used to suddenly bombard a town, destroy it and move away. So even before there is any defense from the town or the military of that particular place, they used to just fly out. So what was the, the, first, the, the arrangement in the town of London was that they used to put on the alarm, the siren. And as soon as there is a siren sound heard, everybody is expected to go underground. This used to happen almost every alternate day. So Gogoi got tired and he said that next time when the siren rings, I am not going to leave my house and go into the underground bunker. I will continue to stay here. And he did exactly that. He went off to his attic and covered himself with a blanket when the siren rang the next time and thought that now I am safe. The siren rang and there was a loud knock on his door and he was wondering who is knocking the door of his house and he did not reply. Then there was a person who said, I am the air raid warden. Open the door, I know you are inside. So Gogoi got scared, he opened the door and the Zaray Warden literally pulled him out of the house and took him to the underground bunker. In a matter of a few minutes after that, there was a bomb attack and the house in which Gogoi was staying was totally destroyed. Gogoi was happy that his life was saved, but he was a little remorseful that he did not thank the Air Raid Warden. He didn't meet him again. He thought maybe the Air Raid Warden lost his life while protecting all these people. That day, 50 years later, Dharma Kshetra, Swami speaks to Gogoi and said, How are you? I have seen you earlier many times. So Gogoi said, But Swami, I am coming here for your darshan the very first time. How have you seen me? Then Swami said, How is that air raid warden? Did you express your gratitude to him? So Gogoi said, No, no, I didn't. He took him some time to remember which air raid warden. And it struck him that yes, that air raid warden had saved his life. Swami said, do you know who that air raid warden was? I was that air raid warden who came to your door and dragged you out of it and took you to the bunker so that you can live a longer life. Not for any other reason. Because you have an important role to perform in my mission and now you will come and stay with me at Prashantinilaya. That is how Swami is guiding our lives even without our knowledge. We meet so many people on a daily basis. We think they are coincidences. There is nothing which is coincidental in the world. Coincidence is an incident where God is the silent worker. That's what a coincidence is all about. Another story is that which I shared with the young adults yesterday, which is shared often in Prashantilam, but I thought I should reaffirm that. And that is the story of this Greek lady who shared her experience of going out into this, the war torn Eastern European regions and there she was heading a team to serve those people and after the service was over they were the first organization, our organization was the first organization to reach there so after distributing food, clothing and essentials they were giving these uh, photographs of Swami with his message just like I have one here now so in that there was a message in Swami's photograph so these people said who is this person he said, he is our master and we are serving on his behalf. Then those people said, but he was with us last two days. He was the one who was giving us food and clothing when no other agency was here. He was the one who was inspiring us saying, this is a passing cloud, things will become better soon. In fact, we thought that he, is come, he has come with you today, getting all this help. So we were thinking that we will see him. It is then that this Greek lady realized, and she had said, shared this during one of the summer courses. She said, it is then that I realized that we don't, so Swami doesn't need us to serve anybody. He is already serving the people who need it. He is only giving us an opportunity to realize 
what the joy of service is and to benefit ourselves in the process the third story is one in vrindavan coming home from where i am vrindavan from india there was this particular worker a gardener in the college of swami's university in the prashant vrindavan campus and his daughter's marriage was planned and so he wanted to give a give an invitation card to swami and he stood he he first requested the warden that swami sir i want to give a invitation card to swami for my daughter's marriage we all give invitation cards to our bosses right and swami was his boss in the technical term so he wanted to give an invitation card to swami so warden got the permission from swami and he was standing at one edge of the prindavan hostel there is an elephant there there is a, a, a small uh, a statue of the elephant at one end of the Vrindavan hostel and he was standing there swami came for darshan he did not look at him he walked all the way into the sai ramesh hall gave darshan there and then went back again after darshan even without seeing him. so this man was totally pressed for him he said swami doesn't care for his employees swami has no value for the lower strata of society he is a god of the rich and the famous and that's what people say many people say about him so i am now convinced that this god is a god of the rich and famous the opulent and the affluent and not of the poor people so he was sitting there and crying and trusting his fate that i am a poor man he kept on standing there hoping that when the warden comes out he will at least give the card to the warden so it can be passed on to swami if not swami take it from himself take it take it himself from him it was 9:35 and all of a sudden there was a hustle bustle at the gates of train train vrinda and swami was walking out so he said oh now swami is going to the house of a vip so he is coming out and leaving swami came out of train vrinda and came straight to this man there was a bag in his hand and then swami said i know you have been wondering why i did not take this card from you you had so many thoughts in your mind about who i am and how partial i am bangaru i did not not take your card because i don't value you i did not take your daughter's marriage card because today is monday and up to 9:30 is rahu kalam and i did not want to accept your card in an inauspicious time because it is one of the most auspicious functions of your family so now you give me the card because the rahu kalam is over and swami gave a bag in which was a heavy zari silk sari for the daughter and also one for his wife and he said this is for them tell them that swami has blessed the marriage and has given all his grace what do we say about all of these people were they devotees of swami in the way we define it were they devoted to swami in the way we think there was once a person who told swami there was an arrangement seva in the 60s and after that he said swami we will give a newspaper report that uh, 600 people were fed in puttaparthi as a part of dasara celebrations so swami asked him a question do you do uh, do you have guests and your family members coming into your house he said yes swami said do you feed them he said yes do you advertise after you feed them he said no swami why then swami said andaru navarle all are my people all the 600 people who were fed here for this festival are my family and i don't give advertisements in newspapers for feeding my own family you may be doing that that is not my practice so everybody and every one in this world is swami's family there is nobody who is beyond him what swami requires is a purity of heart is a genuine feeling of love and a sense of devotion to any form of god you may worship it like dr amorim shared yesterday he was so fond of saints saints of uh, the christian faith i was myself i in a catholic school and have read about lives of so many saints saint xavier saint francis of assisi they have all been such exemplary individuals in fact the current pope has taken the name of one of the great saints of the christian faith because he was known for his service to the poorest of the poor so you need to have feelings for the lowest strata of society you don't need to have any sense of devotion to a form of god which we think is the official form of god 
And Swami always used to share the poem of Abu Ben Adam. You, we all have read the poem of Abu Ben Adam. If you haven't, please read it. We had that as a syllabus in our school in India. And in that story, God sends an angel first to ask all the people who have done a lot of work for God. And everybody says this, 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 that. And when the angel comes to Abu Ben Adam, Abu Ben Adam says, no, I have not done any work for God. I have only done work for my own people, my community. And the, the judgment is going to come the next day as to who is the most favorite individual of God. And he is he's sure that his name will be nowhere in the list because he has never loved God. The next day when the list comes, the angel shares it with him. And there the first name is of Abu Ben Adam. And the angel says, do you know why your name is first? Because you did not love God in one form alone. You loved God in all you saw and served them with the same thing. That is the love, that is the emotion that Swami is looking for. Coming to the lighter side, I like to share an anime, Chinna Katha, which Swami used to share. He spoke about all our, Swami said all is, everybody is my part of my family. And there is this very famous story which Swami has often shared uh, uh, with students. There was a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law. Very interesting with this side of the hall. <laughs> There's a mother-in-law and a daughter-in-law and they all had this uh, constant strife between the two. And uh, the mother-in-law was very dominating. So she wanted everything to be done her way. So when the mother-in-law was in the house, the daughter-in-law did not have any chances. So when the mother-in-law used to go out, the daughter-in-law used to do things which she used to like to So once, a beggar came to that house and he approached the lady of the house, who was the daughter-in-law, mother-in-law was out and said, please give me some arms. So the daughter-in-law said, yes, now is the time for me to exercise my will. And she told the beggar, I am sorry, I will not give you any arms. So this beggar was very sad and he started walking away from the house. On the way, he met the mother-in-law and he asked the mother-in-law, please give me some arms. So she said, where all have you been begging? So he said, I went to these, these houses, he explained, it was not very far away from the house. So she asked him whether she went, he went to a particular house, which was her house. So the beggar said, yes. So she asked with a lot of expectation, did she give you anything? So he said, no. He said, how can she do like that? What did she say? She said, uh, he said, uh, the, uh, the, 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 he said that I can't give you any arms. So this mother-in-law took the beggar around with the house and said, you wait here, I will come. She went inside, met the daughter-in-law, saying that the beggar whom you sent away has come. She came out and then brought the daughter-in-law outside and then told the beggar, I can't give you any arms. So this daughter-in-law was wondering, you said the same thing which I said. Why did you bring the beggar back? She said, because it is my right to tell the beggar that we will not give him any arms, not your right. <laughs> Swami said, that is what mother-in-law means. Swami said, it should not be mother-in-law, it should be mother-in-love. It should not be daughter-in-law, it should be daughter-in-love. That is the true relationship which a family is bound by. These legal relationships lead to re legal output. If you have love relationships, you will have love-based focus. We now move to the fourth part, that is love for students. I am blessed to be a part of that community for 12 years. And Swami has very often said, my students are my only property. We don't claim any exclusive right towards Bhagwan. And what Swami said meant a lot, because he did not mean student as in physical student. For Swami, all those who follow his teachings and his message are his students. But I am talking in a more physical way because I wish to share some aspects of Swami's love for his students. And the first part is that of a mother. How Swami used to correct students as a mother, the love which Swami had for his students as a mother. So there was this huge white Impala car which was gifted by a devotee to Swami. We always wonder, many people, non-devotees ask, 
Why Sakti Sai Baba is using such big cars? They want to wonder why Swami is staying in so much of luxury. Little do they know that these gifts have been literally thrusted by devotees on Swami. They make Swami's life almost impossible without accepting that gift because they have, and it is only to further their satisfaction, their interest that Swami has accepted all these gifts. We all wonder why Swami shifted to Purnachandra Auditorium. In fact, you may not know, in 2004, November, Purnachandra, I'm sorry, Yajur Mandiram construction was over. In 2004, Yajur Mandir construction was over around birthday time. But till, till uh, Ugadi day, uh, New Year day, March 2006, Swami did not shift to by Yajur Mandir. And some of the members of the organization literally pleaded with Swami, Swami, some devotees have given money for this, please shift into Yajur Mandiram because they want you to stay in some comfort. But we don't know that before that, for 43 long years, about the Bhajan Mandir, Swami stayed in a room which was of the size of 8 feet by 10 feet and an attached bathroom of the size of 4 by 6 with an Indian toilet, a wooden bed cot to sleep, a wooden chair and a study table where Swami has written most of his vahinis and a wooden almayra where Swami used to keep his clothes. All of this was only Swami's possession. There was nothing else that Swami claimed as his own. That was the simple life which Swami lived from 1950 when he was just 25 years old till 1993 when he was nearing 70, 68 years. A chunk, major chunk of his life Swami has lived in this kind of simplicity. So, this Impala car, coming back to that, there was a student who wanted to, who had a, this great fascination for driving cars. And in hostel in those years, you don't have cars to drive. This is the 70s. So he got an idea. Why not I drive Swami's car? Those were the days when students had a lot of proximity to Swami. So he somehow got hold of the key and turned on the car. In India, we don't have uh, this P and D and R automatic gears. We have one and two and three and four, and you have to manually change gears. So he said, if I he thought if I put the gear in one, the car will start moving. But he did not realize that the gear should not be put in the first gear till you have switched on the car and the car is wound up to start. He first put the gear in number one and switched on the car, and the car banged onto the door of the garage. And this boy was petrified. Because he had first of all got hold of the car keys, got into Swami's Impala car and then he had banged the car, Swami's car, onto the garage door. So he just ran away from that place, went to the hostel and was in hiding for a couple of days. He didn't come for darshan also. So Swami noticed that and asked the warden, where is this boy, why is he not coming for darshan? There were no video cameras in those days spy camera to see who did it, but we forget that there is one spy camera which is watching us all the time, whether in the darkness of the night or in the broad daylight. So Swami said, where is that boy? Why is he not coming for darshan? Why did the warden had guessed the reason? So he told the boy in the hostel, you better pack your bags first and then go for darshan because after that you will be out. <laughs> so this boy packed his bags and then went for darshan with a lot of trepidation. And there in the darshan, Swami said, why have you not been coming for darshan? Do you think that that car of mine is more valuable than you? No. You are more valuable to me than that inanimate car. I love you more than that. So do not distance yourself from me. All that I expect from you is going to be something you. I wonder if our parents would be as forgiving <laughs> if we are to bang our car. And I request all the young adults and the SSC kids not to test our parents' for their <laughs> Because it would be quite damaging. We are not yet Swami. <laughs> Affection of Swami for students. There was this boy whose mother had passed. The boy was very crestfallen and he was in the hostel room remembering his mother and all the good things she used to do for him. 
And all of a sudden, one parcel came in. Said that Swami has sent this parcel. Not knowing what to expect, he opened the parcel, and there he found one small bottle of Pond's cold cream. It was the winter season, and his mother always used to give him Pond's cold cream to apply so that his skin doesn't become dry in winter. When his physical mother was no more, Swami himself took upon the responsibility to reassure him that I am always there with you. And that bottle of Pond's cold cream was symbolic of the love that Swami has for each one of us. Needless to say, that boy was convinced that there is Swami who is always there for him. Another experience of Swami's love for students in December 1985, Swami had come back to Prashatu Vrindavan after the 60th birthday celebrations. And there, the boys decided to pray to Swami to come to the hostel and address the students and the staff. So the date was decided on 9th December. And one of the students then had his birthday on 9th December. So he was very happy that Swami would come to the hostel on his birthday. But he was also sad that he will not be able to access Swami because when Swami comes to hostel from morning to night, you're busy. You can imagine for Swami's only presence, we have done such a wonderful, wonderful decoration. I got to see Swami's room and even the bathroom which you all put together for Swami. Just so beautifully done with so much of love and devotion. You can imagine the enthusiasm of the students to do something for Swami like that in his physical presence. So he was waiting for the day, Swami came, there was a discourse, there was a music program and then there was no opportunity for personal interaction. So Swami was going back to his residence and this boy started to try and be in the front so that if Swami looks at him, he gets a chance, he will pray to Swami, today is my birthday, Swami please bless me. That did not happen. They went all the way to Swami's bungalow, Swami blessed them from a distance and went off upstairs. Everybody left and this boy had tears in his eyes that I lost the golden opportunity of getting Swami's Pad Namaskar. And he was waiting there near the door, just trying to visualize how Swami would have really blessed him. About a couple of minutes later, there was a sound tap, and the door of Swami's room opened. And this boy was down the stairs and Swami was up the stairs. And then Swami said, Hey, I have got this kerchief from the hostel by mistake. Why don't you take it back? So this boy jumped at the opportunity, he ran up the steps to take the kerchief from Swami. Then Swami called him near him and said, Today is your birthday, isn't it? I know. That's why I opened the door now, so that I can bless you. He gave him Padmanaskar, he gave him Vibhuti Prasada, and he left. There is no aspect of our life which Swami is not aware of, and there is no genuine prayer that Swami doesn't answer. It has to be at the right time. The student is now a great scientist working in one of the top uh, corporate labs in India. His name is Dr. K. Anil Kumar and his experience is shared in the Satisavit Students blog which Priti just shared. There are hundreds of these experiences which you can access and enjoy. Why I am giving you names is that these individuals in Swami nurture and we have each one of these in different strata of society have blossomed forth as such responsible individuals but the only thing they don't forget is the love that Swami gave. Another important part of Swami's priorities was food, concern for students' food. So the 16th birthday celebrations, there were 600 marriages which were performed. And at the end of the marriages, all the students who were helping with the work were called by Swami onto the terrace. And there, they were with Swami and they were winding up the day's program putting things back into the cupboards and all of that. And then Swami asked all of them, did you have your food? So they said, no Swami. They did not say that actually because they wouldn't say that to Swami, but the indication of their face communicated that they had not. Swami said, I know you have not had food, so I have just got fresh dosas made for you. So he sent one of the students to the kitchen, of Swami's own kitchen in the mandir behind. And one, there was one another vessel with chutney. So those two came up, Swami took each dosa, took the spoon, put chutney on the dosa, folded it and gave it to each of the students saying, Bangaru, I am very happy with the work you have done and the, the contribution that you have made for the successful marriages that were performed today for 600 couples of the village. 
That is the love the Swami has in terms of food. That is the love of a mother. But he also uses the opportunity to teach students a lesson. There was this interaction in the interview room with a certain set of students and that student is uh, now a very senior, uh, he's a managing director of one of the big finance companies in India, he's an alumnus of Swami's management program and he shared this with us and he came to Prashantan his name is Pushkar Raj. And while he was sharing his experiences, he said once when we were in the interview room, Swami gave us snacks and in that snacks was muruku. Muruku is a South Indian crunchy uh, snack which when you eat, invariably crumbs fall on the ground because that's the nature of that thing. So usually you have a, a dish below it, but invariably in spite of that, the crumbs fall down. So Swami always ensured that whenever he gave interview, he used to give some snack item by and large for students. After, while after the uh, snack was over, what happened, the students saw some crumbs around them. So they, they quietly shoved them below the carpet. <laughs> not knowing that Swami was observing. So after that the conversation went towards how we make mistakes in life and what we should do to rectify those mistakes. And Swami was asking questions and the students were answering. Then this question came up and said, Swami said, how do you, they asked Swami what, how, what do we do about mistakes, how do we rectify them? Swami said, we should not do what you just now did with the Muruku crumbs. <laughs> when we make the mistake, what we usually do is we shove them below the carpet. We just hide them behind and pretend they never happened. Swami said, you must accept your mistake to yourself and then decide not to make it again. That is the way to correct yourself. So that is the way Swami used to lovingly correct the students. This is the mother aspect. Now we come to the father aspect. Swami used to bless students with a lot of interviews as a group. And I'm sure we have Eskumar sir here and so many of them, Brother Shankar and there are so many, so many alumni here from the earlier batches who have had the opportunity of seeing that much, much more than I have. Most of what I share is what I've heard and from first-hand information of these uh, seniors from the university. But they have seen it first-hand. And Swami used to have them in the interview room. And in one such interview room, Swami was uh, uh, talking to the students and the warden, Dr. Shishankar Sai was the warden of the hostel. He saw that Swami's eye was red. So he took the courage to ask Swami, Swami, your eye is red. So Swami's response was, yes, I know, but I don't waste water. So they did not realize the connection. They thought Swami did not hear. Many times when Swami used to give unconnected answers, we used to think, Papa, Swami is not able to hear anything. <laughs> So we make Swami Papa, poor, uh, Papa means poor fellow, something like that, equivalent of that. So we used to, we always feel that way. So, so Swami said, I don't waste water. So Dr. Shivan said, again repeated, no Swami, about the eye. So Swami said, yes. Today when I was washing my face, I, what I do is, I put on the tap, apply water to my face, switch off, close the tap, then apply soap, then again put on the tap and apply water. Today, between the time of applying the face and again putting on the tap for the water, it took a little longer and at that time, the soap went up into my eye. But I don't waste water. I close the tap in between the times I wash my face. And Swami said, but these boys, when they are shaving in the hostel, the water is continuously on and they are going on singing songs and shaving and all the water goes down the drain. Whose grandfather's property you think is that water? <laughs> Don't waste water. Another occasion, Swami used to uh, bless some of us to accompany him to Kodakinar. And I have had the opportunity to go with him three times, blessed by him to accompany him. And we always used to see that after having food, Swami used to swallow a mouthful of water. So one of the elders asked Swami, Swami usually, uh, after food we don't have water, we have water after some time, so why do you swallow this mouthful of water? Swami said, that is because I don't waste food. So again this person thought that Swami is not able to hear. He said, no Swami, water, water. He said, yes, that is because I don't waste food. After you eat your food, there are so many small grains of food in different parts of your mouth. I ensure that all of them are also swallowed. But you boys, you all never finish what is in your plate. And big letters in the canteen and the hostels of Prashant Niyam and other educational institutions 
It is written Annam Brahma, God who is God. So you aspire for the God in physical form and waste the God in the form of food. Don't waste food, it is the gift of God. And then there is this aspect of what Swami used to do in the interview room. Every time there used to be an interview and this, this even devotees would have noticed, he used to switch on the light and fan when the devotees are in the room. And the moment the devotees go out, he used to switch off the light and fan, though he used to sit inside. So one of the elders asked, Swami, why do you switch it on when we come and switch it off when we go? Because Swami, then Swami said, because I don't need light. There is enough light from that window, you know that famous window, from which Swami used to look outside and see whether the boys are disciplined and sitting in their place and watching over them in the physical sense. He said, I don't need light, it is there and there is very good ventilation. So I don't need the fan, this is for all of you. But you boys, when you leave your room in the hostel, you leave the light and fan on for all the four hours of darshan time and waste all that energy. That energy is God's gift. Fan was invented by man, not air. You hail the inventor of fan and light, but do you hail the giver of that energy and that air which helps you get this fan and light? Don't waste energy. And then, one Swami was in the baranda and was talking with students and that fine day Swami started asking the, he did a budgeting exercise he said which soap do you use which toothpaste do you use which toothbrush do you use and for every item that he was asking the students he used to put, he used to ask them the price of it so people thought oh Swami is trying to find out what are the rates in the market <laughs> after that whole exercise was over Swami said see showed them. All that we have just discussed are the items that you use in the hostel on a daily basis. And based on the costing that you have given me, here is the proof, this was in the 80s, not now, here is the proof that we can lead a good life staying in the hostel for only 100 rupees in a month. Don't waste money. Your parents forego their, their, their food, their personal life, their luxuries, so that you are given comfort, you have no right to waste your parents' money. It is true today that 100 rupees may have become 5000 rupees or 1000 rupees depending on the cost in different parts of the world. But what is important is that we can lead a simple life with limited resources. Don't waste money. And then, one Swami was uh, uh, talking with the students in the veranda again was talking about the morning prayer session in the college and Swami said today the prayer session started 10 minutes late and you made me wait. They were looking at each other, some of them got late for the prayer session so they were looking at each other, did Swami come for the prayer session today? They were asking each other, those who did, who, who, who made it late for some other work. So uh, Swami, uh, they said no, no, Swami didn't come, that was the indication. In Prashant we see boys looking at each other in expressions and communicating answers. That's our secret language. So Swami uh, said, uh, oh no, no, I did not come today, but I don't need to be there. I was exactly at 9 o'clock sitting on the chair in the foyer and the prayer started at 9.10 and you made me wait. You wasted 10 minutes of my time. When you put a time of the schedule on the board, you have to yourself follow. I am there for every SSC class, he told one Balvikas SSC teacher, exactly at the time when it is scheduled. If you lay, if you start late, you are making me wait because I am very particular about time because time waste is life waste. Don't waste time. So we discussed five things which Swami used to teach as a father would for a fruitful life for his son. Don't waste. What was the first thing I said? Water. Second? Food. Third? Energy. Money. Time. Five things. Very commonplace things. These are the five pillars of the Ceiling on Desires program which Swami started in 1976. Decades before, the sustainable development and the environment sensitivity movement swept the world with the responsibility of being sensitive for water, food, energy, etc. etc. Swami has been giving this message since decades in simple fashion so that we can understand. That is the power of Swami's message.
and that is the way he used to. If you want to share something for your leap project and pilot your life in the direction you wish to and share what you learned here as they shared yesterday, do share with your friends outside these five pillars which make a very, very useful and fruitful life. A simple example of Swami as a friend, I thought I would share and then move to other aspects. There was this set of students from the band. We had a wonderful band program yesterday. We all gave a loud round of applause for the dance drama. But the band was equally wonderful to have a band of that coordination here in this part of the region. It was a great, great team. I know what I thought it made people have seen my friends and my peers and my seniors, juniors and Prashant Lim blowing their breath into the instrument and we all feel what is there I think we should do it to know what is there if you have to blow your breath day in and day out for hours together just to master the instrument you will know what effort it is and that's why Swami used to be so fond of band students because for 6 months day in and day out they used to practice and get ready with the only hope and the expectation that Swami will be happy, he will smile, he will raise his hand or he will do very good or whatever indication he would give. So these band boys were in the Purnachandra auditorium and all of them were praying to Swami for partners. Why? Because Swami had got the first set of band dresses stitched and this experience is shared by Nana Dhatan Sanjay Sani sir who is now the director of the Brindavan campus. He was also a band student and there they were bargaining with Swami that Swami got Pad Namaskar. Swami said, no, you have given, you got two dresses today. Swami had got them stitched, he had got the tailor, they taken measurements, got it stitched and then one day he called them to wear them, they wore and they were showing Swami about how good the fitting is. They said, Swami Pad Namaskar. So he said, no. And then as the friends bargained, there was a bargaining going on. And finally at the end of the bargaining, Swami just walked off from that place. This is the Poonachandra, he sat, he walked off and went all, off, all the way to the stage there. And the students thought, oh, we have upset Swami. So they were looking at Swami from a distance. Swami went there, stood on top of the stage, and then looked at the uh, students, and then said, come. So they thought that, oh, maybe Swami wants to say bye or something. So they came near Swami. And Swami said, what is wrong with you? First you were pestering me for Path Namaskar. Now I'm standing on stage with my feet so clearly seen so that you can take standing Path Namaskar and you are not taking Path Namaskar. I went to the stage so that you can take Path Namaskar standing so that your clothes don't get dirty and at the same time you get your Path Namaskar. That is the friendly Swami. He will give in to some of your pleadings only so that you are able to appreciate why he wants you to do some things. That is the love of a friend. Then we come to the love of a guru in Swami for his students. That part of Swami's, uh, Swami's personality, I would like to share with a couple of examples. We always talk about unity of religions and how religions have a lot of diversities, but in our organization we talk about unity. There are many students from different faiths who come to Prashantlin to study. And I had a student, his name was Ramzan Ali was a student of the MBA program and he was not a devotee, he had come from a totally unknown background but he felt that this university would give him the kind of inputs he is looking for and he was a practicing Muslim, he studied in our university and the month of Ramzan came in and there is a mosque in Puttaparthi, there are two mosques in Puttaparthi, one Swami himself built for the Muslims of Puttaparthi and there is another mosque next to the hostel. So he got the permission of the warden to go early in the morning for the early morning namaz. And the warden gave him permission, saying that yes, you can go for the namaz and come back. All through those few weeks, he used to have this inner voice telling him, be ready, be ready, be ready. He did not know why this message is coming to him. And then, one fine day when he had gone to the mosque, there was this set of Muslims who had come from other part of India. Not aware of Swami, but they knew that there is a mosque in this place. So they had come to stay there overnight and use the facility. And they came to know that this boy is a student from Swami's university. So after the namaz was over, they were interacting with him. And they asked him, how are you staying in a Kufristan? A Kufristan is a place which has, which worships idols. Right? And we know that Sanadhan Dharma worships idols because there is a means to the final end. So it's not looked upon well in the Islam religion. 
So they were uh, trying to ask him that, is it not a contrast to your religion? So this boy then recollected, Swami was telling him through his dreams a couple of times over the last few weeks, be ready, be ready. So he realized that this was the reason for which Swami was telling him. And he told those people that in my experience at Prashanti Nilayam, I have found no dichotomy between the principles of Islam and the principles of Sanatana Dharma. Because Prashanti Nilayam is the only place in my opinion where Islam is truly practiced. Because Islam believes that there is only one God, Allah, and He is omnipresent. In Prashanti Nilayam, the same feeling exists that there is only one God and He is omnipresent. That has been my experience of this place, was the conviction with which Ramzan Ali shared his experience with those Muslims who had come from outside. We always talk about differences of religion, but Swami has very, very practically shown the essence of all religions being the same. I would just like to highlight that in, a, in an analogy. We talk about the three different aspects of Sanatana Dharma, Advaita, Vishishta Advaita and Dvaita. We know what those three are, right? In Christianity, the same three aspects exist depicted through the evolution of Jesus. So first Jesus said, I am the messenger of God. Then he said, I am the son of God. And then he said, I and my father are one. In Islam, it's the same thing. Muhammad first said, I am in the light. Then he said, the light is in me. And then finally he said, I and the light are one. These are all the stages of evolution. You start with dualism, Dvaita, which is the messenger of God, I am in the light. You and the light, you and God is different. And you are Vishishta Dvaita, where you are an aspect of God, though distinct from me. So I am the son of God. Son has characteristics of the father, though he is different from him. And I am in the light. I am part of the light. I am part of my father. Right? And last is Advaita. Everything is divine. Sanatana Dharma and Christianity. I and my father are one. And in Islam, I and the light are one. There is no difference between these religions. Only the ways of practicing them are different. And Swami always highlighted on these unity aspects of the religion and not the diversity. Unfortunately, all the efforts we make today are on dividing religions based on differences and not uniting them. There was a question yesterday about terrorism and the problems of the world with Dr. Amor in answer. Another way of Swami's uh, teaching the students was through examples from the academic field. So once in Trai Vrindavan, Swami started talking to the students and the exams were just over. And Swami asked them, your exams are over, you have got the results? Yes. So Swami said, which three subjects you have? So then the answers came, physics, chemistry, mathematics. Right? The Chancellor is doing analysis of the examination results. So these were the three subjects they had. And then Swami said, okay, now some of you, I want to ask you a question, Swami said, some of you have got 90 out of 100 in physics. Some of you have got 60 out of 100 in chemistry and some of you have got 20 out of 100 in mathematics. Have you passed the exam with this kind of result? They said no. Swami said why? He said Swami you need to pass in all the three subjects to pass the exam otherwise you have to repeat the year. So Swami said oh is it so? Swami said, he said yes Swami. Swami said okay. Then Swami said then in daily life you are great in your actions, 90 marks. You are also great in your words, 60 marks. But in thoughts, you get only 20 marks. Can you pass in God's exam, Swami said. Swami said, just as you can't pass the academic exam without pass marks in all the three, you cannot pass God's exam without doing well in thought, word and deed. This is how Swami taught Trikarna Shuddhi to students. Another occasion, Swami is sharing about what is true meditation. And in that Swami gave a very very clear answer. What is true meditation? Swami said, in the one of the summer courses Swami said, people have different definitions of meditation. I am giving you only one by definition. What is that definition? Swami said, meditation means, one, shut your mouth. And second, open your heart. This is meditation which Swami explained to students. 
And Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa had given a similar teaching in meditation to Rani Rasmani, who was a great queen, who was giving uh, uh, the, the uh, who had actually appointed Ramakrishna as a temple priest. And in the discourse and the satsang which was going on, she was sitting there and thinking about the legal matters of her estate. And Ramakrishna Paramahamsa went there and slapped this lady, queen, lady, slapping. So everybody thought Ramakrishna has lost it. <laughs> So, uh, Ramakrishna then told this lady, if you want to think about legal matters, go to the court. Don't sit here under me in the name of satsanga and think about legal matters. You only have to think about God. So, shut your mouth. This, do the, this does the maximum chattering. And open your heart. That is true meditation. And another aspect which Swami has taught to students is this mantra. Whatever happens is good for you. Whatever happens is good for you. Whatever happens is good for you. Keep chanting this mantra all the time in good and bad times. Swami said there was this occasion where a farmer was waiting for the rains and a trader was avoiding the rains, was praying that there should be no rains because the daughter's marriage has to be performed. Both were selfishly playing, praying for their welfare. Nobody said, oh God, let thy will prevail. Everybody wanted my will to prevail. Swami said, this is foolishness. You should accept whatever happens as God's will because God has to take care of the whole world, not of two of you. That is how Swami has taught spirituality in the most practical way to students. And now as God, Swami is God. Divinity is shared with the students. One of my experiences I would like to share, we always used to give Swami some gifts at the end of the year as a class. We were class gift Swami and we all thought in those years Swami had stopped wearing colored robes. So we thought that we indicate to Swami that we want to see him in different colored robes. So at the end of our whole two years program we got three robes stitched, one yellow, one white and one, one maroon, no orange and sent it to Swami with a gratitude note. Usually the warden would go with a few class representatives and stand at the entrance of Chandra residence and then someone there will take it and forward it to Swami. So uh, Swami did not accept the gift when he came to know there are robes and he told the warden there that tell the boys I don't want robes, if they want robes I will give them. <laughs> so this message came to the hostel and we were all very upset. Why Swami did not accept our gift? After all he gives all gifts, one gift in a year he can accept. So then I was there in that room, in my room I still remember room number C20, we were 14 of us in that room, the third floor of the hostel and I said in that conversation, Swami said he wants to give robes to us, no, why doesn't he give? He will take it home and give it to our parents to be kept at the altar. That was a loud conversation. So this boy in my room said, why don't you tell that to Swami this evening? I said, why should I tell Swami this evening? There was a photograph of Swami there, I said, he's hearing, see here is his photograph, he's hearing. Believe me, that evening, Swami was passing by, I was going back from the hospital to the uh, mandir. He came, he stood outside the hostel and uh, called the warden in the car he was going and he told the warden that, uh, tell the boys to come early today, I have some work for them. So all the boys went to mandir early, all the boys. And Swami says that everybody will go. And there in mandir, we saw huge stacks of robes, about 1,000 of them all over the bhajan hall and all of that, so many devotees have given robes to Swami as gifts, right? We, 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 there were so many pieces of information in the newspapers that when the stock taking was done in Swami's residence, so many robes were found, so many saris were found. All of these are gift items which Swami used to give. All the ladies day saris, all the sports meet gifts, all of these year after year, year after year were stacked in the rooms and distributed every year. And again another stock will come, again some will distribute them. So all these ropes, a thousand of them were there, brand new. Some of them some would have only accepted, not worn definitely. So he distributed all of them. At the end of that distribution, he looked at my direction and mischievously smiled over. One month later, we are in Trai Vrindavan. That day I go, I, I got late for uh, the bhajans in Ramesh Hall. I go and sit at the end of that particular line. And from the stage, Swami is continuously looking at me. And when he is looking at me, he is uh, looking at me, he is looking down again, looking at me. 
wondering something is in the offing. You saw me keep looking at you actually as a student, you get scared. Because you'll be very happy. Oh, Swami is looking at you. As a student, you get very scared. Oh my god, something has gone involuntarily wrong because Swami is looking at me only. So with that trepidation, I was sitting behind. And then the lines left for a train session. So we all rushed inside. And luckily, and though I came last, that line which I was sitting in went first. So I was in the fourth row in front of Swami's Jula. And I had a letter to Swami. I had uh, actually my birthday was there a few days before. So I had written a letter. Swami accepted the letter and all of that. And then he told me, You talk now. That was 8th of April 2004. And I gave a talk. In that talk, I shared the same experience of the row and how what we spoke in the hostel room was responded to by Swami the very same day in the Mandir. The whole thing over, Swami, after I finished the talk, Swami looked at some of the teachers and students uh, uh, who was there, uh, Dr. Ravi Kumar was there, who is now the Vrindavan Hostel Warden. He said, go upstairs, I have kept something ready. Satyajit will give it to you. So when Dr. Ravi Kumar went up, he went there and he came down. And what was in his hand was a stack full of robes. So Swami said, I knew this boy will talk about robe in his speech. That's why even before I came for bhajans, I told Satyaji to keep all the robes from Vrindavan ready because Vrindavan boys did not get robes. I knew this boy will talk about robes, that will be the trigger point and I will distribute the robes to all the students. So you see how he works. I come late, I sit in the right line, he keeps looking at me, that line goes first for three lines and three sessions don't go in a planned way. Randomly they will say first, second, third or there will be some token, the different times, different things. I go and sit there, he looks at me, I have a letter, it was my birthday a few days earlier and then I speak about the robe in that talk and before all this happens, the robes are ready in his room. So we feel we are talking, it is actually he who is talking, he who is doing, he who is implementing and executing, we are only the puppets. We saw that thing here, right? Yesterday, we were all actors. The director was not seen. That wonderful lady, that auntie who was doing the work, she was not seen, only the actors were seen. But without the director, can there be actors on stage? The fact that there are actors on stage means that there is a director in the background. Which role which actor will do is the job of the director. Because the director knows the potential and credential of every actor. So based on that, he puts it. But just because director is not seen doesn't mean that there are no actors. Similarly, just because God is not seen doesn't mean that this creation is an autopilot. Just as, just as the pilot is not seen flying the flight, but if you see the plane, you know there is a pilot. You see a plane, you know there is a director. You see the world and you know that there is God behind it. This is what is called Anumana Pramana. Anumana Pramana of Nyaya Shastra from the Shakdarshana. Nyaya, Vaisheshika, Samkhya, Yoga, Puro Mimamsa and Uttar Mimamsa. These are the six parts of the Shaddarshanas. The first Nyaya Shastra teaches this logical reasoning to understand how God exists. Once another example which was uh, of an MBA student, Shirish Patil from the 96-98 batch. We all go to Swami with our project reports for blessing after we finish it. So this person had done a study on the petrochemical industry in India. And he wanted, everybody would want Swami to touch their report. It's the fine satisfaction. He went to Swami and then all of a sudden Swami opened his report. He asked him, what is your project on? He said, petrochemical industry. Then Swami said, you have written about the Rakesh Mohan committee in your report, isn't it? This boy was flabbergasted. We know Swami gives spiritual talks. We didn't know Swami even knows about petrochemical industry reports. <laughs> Swami opened his project and exactly on the page where he wrote about the Rakesh Mohan committee, Swami said, see, you have written, isn't it? I know, I am telling you this only to know that I also know I don't talk about it. <laughs> that is the way Swami used to constantly remind the students, without chamatkar there is no namaskar in our place they say. Without the larger than life appeal of the master, there will be very difficult uh, obedience to his message. All of this was done by Swami to communicate that. I also went with Swami to Swami with my PhD thesis on stakeholders management. That's what uh, Priti introduced. And in that, I had studied uh, through two inter uh, to 100 interviews and about uh, 1300 uh, survey forms, what impacts a corporate organization and all of that. And through all statistical analysis, the, the, the conclusion was that employee value systems and culture of the organization 
play a very important role in the organization success. Amongst all the other things they do, this is what is most important. That was my study. I went to Swami. I shared that with Swami in my uh, in that in that brief conversation. This was 2010 uh, August, and I said, Swami, what I have said is what exactly is said by you in man management. And Swami looked at me and said. I have already said that 20 years back. What is the new thing that you have found in your research? <laughs> then in chapter of Gada, Swami said, I have already told you, isn't it? It is not that my thesis didn't add any value. It is to communicate to us that he has already said these things. We are now verifying this through our experiments. Spirituality has already put forward the highest secrets of the cosmic creation. Scientists are verifying it through the Higgs boson experiment and sharing how the God particle is that unknown element which catalyzes the evolution of creation. These are all things which are there in all the world scriptures. We have not been able to get convinced about it and we invest our time in order to study it scientifically. Good, no doubt. But if we accept it because the sages have done that, they have gone through their experience, we will be able to move much faster. And in one occasion Swami shared with the students Swami said, do you know how the scriptures came? The Vedas are called Apavrusheya. They do not have origin to any human being, Purusha. So they are beyond human. Swami said, do you think that, but how did they come into existence? Do you think somebody sat and wrote these Vedas? Do you think Manu Smriti, Manu sat chalo one day, I will sit and write the Manu Smriti, the code of conduct for all creation. Swami said, no. He said, do you know how these things have come into being? The sages used to sit in meditation. They used to cross the mind. They used to reach the higher mind. They used to cross the higher mind and they used to reach the illuminated mind. They used to cross the illuminated mind and they used to reach the super mind. They used to cross the super mind and they used to reach the over mind. And after crossing over mind, they used to reach a stage which is called Amanaska, beyond the mind. In that stage where the mind no longer exists, they were able to connect with the cosmic vibrations. They captured those cosmic vibrations in the highest states of meditation, absorbed them and then converted that into these Vedic scriptures that we have got. Right? We say that the angel Gabriel came and revealed the Quran to Mormon. It was not spoken in Arabic. It was these vibrations which were communicated, which was shared. Same is the case with Moses. Same is the case with all the world scriptures. So that is why the sanctity of these scriptures, because it is not an it is not a product of the human mind, it is the product of the cosmic mind. So that is the truth of how Swami used to communicate his love and his omniscience to I go to the last part, I know I have got 15 minutes left, 20 minutes left, or 2 minutes left. <laughs> 20 minutes, great. So we go to the last part and that is love of Swami for the humanity. What is the love that Swami has for the humanity? And how do we understand that love? We can understand that love only through one single thing. The time Swami invested maximum in which thing? The maximum time Swami invested was in giving a message for posterity. 5,000 discourses have been given by Swami. He blew his breath in the form of words and communicated for hours and hours on end for the sake of mankind. That is the greatest love of Swami for mankind. He has given a message. We have one Bhagavad Gita which we revere so much. We have one Quran, one Bible, one Zenda Vista, one Torah. We have one, one scripture of every religion. But mankind was more wise than to understand from one scripture. Today Swami has given us 35 Satasai speaks. 15 summer showers, 18 vahinis, 5 my dear students volumes, all of this with the only purpose so that we understand his message. And the greatest tribute that we can pay to Swami is by reading this. Reading this every single day. Just two pages. This is called Swadhyaya. In the Ashtanga Marga, there is Yama and Niyama. Yama consists of five parts. Ahimsa, Satya, Aste, Parikra, Brahmacharya. These are the five parts of Yama, right? Non-violence, righteous life, non-covetousness, non-stealing, and uh, truth. These are the five parts before you get ready for a higher spiritual life. Then Niyama. What are the five parts of Niyama? Saucha, purity, inner and outer. Santosha, contentment. Uh, 
ಶೌಚ ಸಂತೋಷ ಸ್ವಾಧ್ಯಾಯ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿ ಎವ್ರಿ ಸಿಂಗಲ್ ಡೇ ತಪಸ್ ಪೆನಿನ್ಸ್ ಅಂಡ್ ಈಶ್ವರ ಪ್ರಣಿಧಾನ ಸರೆಂಡರ್ ಟು ಗಾಡ್ ಸೊ ದಿಸ್ ಸ್ವಾಧ್ಯಾಯ ಇಸ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆಂಟ್ ಪಾರ್ಟ್ ಇವನ್ ದ ತೈತ್ರೇಯ ಉಪನಿಷದ್ ಹೈಲೈಟ್ಸ್ ಇದೆ ಶಿಕ್ಷಾವಲ್ಲಿ ಸ್ವಾಧ್ಯಾಯ ನ ಪ್ರಮಾಣಿತವ್ಯ ಡೋಂಟ್ ಗಿವ್ ಅಪ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿ ಗಿವ್ ಅಪ್ ಎನಿಥಿಂಗ್ ಎಲ್ಸ್ ಡೋಂಟ್ ಗಿವ್ ಅಪ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿ ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದಿ ಇಂಪಾರ್ಟೆನ್ಸ್ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ಬೀಂಗ್ ಗಿವನ್ ಟು ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿ ಆಲ್ ಥ್ರೂ ಸ್ಕ್ರಿಪ್ಚರ್ಸ್ but the problem is we don't understand we don't read and because we don't read we don't understand so the greatest love of swami for mankind is communicated through his message in fact prof sri k goka once asked sri kama udhani one of the greatest vedic exponents and sri gandikota subramanyam shastri who was the giver of the sai gaj mantra that he got a doubt only past seventh standard physically but how is he able to quote from all these scriptures and vedas and write commentaries on that see when and ask them is the commentary given by swami authentic is it what is written in the scriptures in terms of interpretation and she kama adani and she gandhi gurudev sahib sahib told so told the prof sahib ke goka he said it is not what swami is saying is there in the scriptures what swami is saying is the scripture because he is telling so many many things which are explaining the scriptures in a much better fashion than what the prophets and the philosophers of the past have been able to do that is the value of sai literature which we need to give to there was this occasion in 2009 when swami had blessed a few german devotees to share the music program before him and at the end of the program they all said swami we love you swami we love you so that time swami said and the satyajit had shared it also swami said no 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 don't love me love my message because my message this is what what the second part is what i am saying because the message of the master is the master himself when mummy tells something for us to do in the house and we say we love mummy but we don't listen to her directions <laughs> same is the case with god he may not give you a spanking he will teach you the harder way so better go the easier way and get that hug from mummy so that you are always the recipient of her love that is what the message of the master symbolizes and i'd like to highlight a few things from swami's message which is very very important swami redefined spirituality he said everything is divine the scriptures say neeti 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 not this not this god is not this god is not that god is not this speaker phone god is not that painting god is not this roof is something beyond swami redefined saying neeti neeti means not not this not this it means not only this not only this god is not only this microphone not only the roof not only the painting he is everything everything is divine there is nothing which is jada inert in this world everything is titan everything is consciousness so i means redefine that and there is a misnomer in, the, in some of the indian households that vedas the gayatri mantra and all of that cannot be chanted by ladies and swami said who said that the lady the de- deity of the gayatri mantra is the lady herself now who prevents you from chanting gayatri mantra the mantra is being chanted for the soul evolution gender belongs only to the body not to the soul spirituality is for the spirit <laughs> then swami always used to address us as divyatma swarupala the scriptures have always said the scriptures don't address us as ladies and gentlemen brothers and sisters no the scriptures address us as shrumant vishve amrutasya putra listen or children of immortality that is our status we are all children of immortality we are not sinners in fact in india there is a way of uh, starting your prayer you say papo ham papa karmo ham papa atma papa sab i am a sinner i am born in sin i am leading a sinful life i am heading towards sin swami once told one pujari who was doing it in the mandir he said no 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 not papo ham papa karmo ham prapto ham prapta karmo ham prapta atma prapta sab i am born out of divinity i am leading a divine life i am heading towards divinity that is how swami has redefined the genuine essence of spirituality for our understanding another experience swami used to always ask us where do you come from where do you come from? he asked that to me many times for two years swami asked me where do you come from where do you come from so many other experience experiences in between and i used to wonder what is wrong with swami <laughs> same question same answer but i can ask you 10 times first day where do you come from last day where do you come from where do you come from 
Then I said something is there, I must understand what Swami is asking. Then I thought let me give the answer which usually Swami expects us to give. So once in Bhajan Hall when I was joining M. Phil, Swami asked, where do you come from? I said from you Swami. It was the last time he asked me that question <laughs> because that lesson had gone in that we have all come from divinity. We have not come from Bombay or from Chennai or from New York. That is only the where the body is coming from. We have come from divinity. And that is why in the discourse in 2003 November, Swami said, we have all become nameless envelopes. The nameless envelopes goes to the dead letter box. Right? Do you want to be a nameless envelope? You don't have a to address, you don't have a from address. You need to know where you have come from. You need to know where you are heading. If you have these things very, very clearly, you are heading in the right direction. Just as the letter from FedEx, which Preeti sent for the warm weather, had a to address and a from address. She sent here, point till, parti, to the weather gods, please. That's how it came. That's how all the prayers are answered. That's how the life has to be lived. Another important thing, we all have this Difficulty in understanding this Atma Brahma concept. Everything is fine. The moment the word Atma is used, I was so happy that Dr. Amor had used the word Atma so many times. Coming from him from Latin America is so, so encouraging that he's understood Swami's message so well and he's able to share it with us. In spite of having English as a second language, he's able to, and Indian as no language, he's able to pick up this concept and talk about Atma. If you ask me to speak any Latin American word, I will just raise my hand. Not in this life, I may not be able to pick it up. It's really commendable. What is Atma? Simple example. We always, little, little crude example but important. Whenever someone passes away, recently I lost my grandfather. We say that so and so has passed away. But so and so's body is here, right? My grandfather was still in the house. But he said, grandfather passed away. Then who is the grandfather? Is he the body or the body is still in the house? Or is he the one who was residing in the body and that resident has passed away? So are we the resident in the body or are we the body itself? If we are the body, then why do we say when someone passes away that someone has passed away and the body is still there? That is because we are not the body, we are in the body. And where are we in the body and what are we in the body? And the Narayan Suttam gives an answer to that. It is said in the Narayan Suttam, and I'll give the verse and I will explain in English. Neelato yada madhyastha vidyul lekheva bhaswara nivara shukavattanvi pita bhaswatya nubama tasya ashikhaya madhye paramatma vivasthita. Between the 9th and 12th vertebral column, there exists a blue shining light. And that blue shining light is the Atma Tattva and that Atma Tattva has come from the Paramatma Tattva and to all of us whether Latin America, America, India, Europe, any color, any shape, any size, any continent, any country, same blue light. And Bhagavad Gita Krishna says that all creation is part of my eternal being. That means that blue light has come from the Supreme Divinity that blue light has to go out back into the Supreme Divinity. That is what Swami used to say. I feel so happy when I see all of you because I see myself in all of you. He is able to see that blue light in all of us. And he sees it shining effortlessly with the desire to come back to him. That is the kind of spiritual understanding that Swami has repeatedly given to us. Another example, we have a silver tumbler, a silver plate, a silver chain, a silver ring, a silver bell. Everything is different. But what is the essential element of that? Silver. When we look at the object, we forget that it is made of silver. When we look, that's why for a robber, the object doesn't matter, the silver matters. Whatever is there, he will grab it because it is silver. If we have a robber's vision in this world, we will be able to see Atma in everybody because it is only Atma. We will not see the diversity, diversity in the body. That is the kind of message Swami has given us. What is the highest sadhana we need to do in order to reach this? That also answer Swami has given and I shared that with the young adults yesterday. In the Akhand Bhajan of 2007,
Swami after the completion of Akhand Bhajan, he gave a discourse and he said, All of you are very happy that you have done Akhand Bhajan. This is not Akhand Bhajan. This is Khand Bhajan. It is only a part Bhajan. Real Akhand Bhajan starts from the womb and goes on to the tomb. It starts from the cradle and moves on till you go into the grave. That Akhand Bhajan is already going on inside you. 21,600 times your breath is telling you, So hum, so hum, so hum. I am that, I am that, I am that. But like a musk deer, you are looking for the musk outside when the musk is very much in your belly. You are looking for God outside. You are not looking at the God who is inside you because you are chattering, talking, discussing, doing. You are not shutting your mouth and opening your heart and listening. When you listen to that 21,600 times a day, your Namaswaran will be incessantly going on. You don't need to put any efforts. You don't need to do any other sadhana. Spiritualize every activity of your life. Swami said in the discourse, a housewife, if she does cooking, if she does with the feeling that this is for Swami, even if the husband, daughter, friend, daughter-in-law, anybody eats, the satisfaction is that Swami has eaten that food. That is spirituality. If you are a doctor and you do a job that you are treating Swami, if you are a manager and you treat the customer as Swami, if you are a teacher and you teach that the student is Swami, then there is no other spirituality in that. Spiritual life and worldly life do not need to be segregated. Swami said spirituality is not when you go for and put on the uniform of white color and do part-time spirituality in the center or samiti. Swami said your boys do bhajans in the mandir. And that bhajan should continue in the bathroom and the room and the work and the college. Everywhere that silent bhajan should be going on. Because even the corporate organization, the government doesn't give full salary for part-time work. Part-time devotion, part-time grace. Full-time devotion, full-time grace. You cannot be a shareholder saying I will invest in God and I will expect a profit sharing partnership. No, you have to surrender to God. You have to be devoted to God. You have to leave everything to God and you have to have that kind of faith that whatever he says is what is true. And what is the value of human life after all? There was a very famous story of Akbar and Birbal. Akbar asked this question. There are these Akbar Birbal tales in India where important value stories are communicated. And they're similar in south of the Tanali Ramakrishna and uh, Krishnadevaraya. So Akbar asked Birbal, what is the value of, uh, what, what is the most valueless thing in the society? So Akbar, uh, Birbal immediately answered, uh, uh, your lordship, the human head is the most worthless thing in the society. So Akbar was shocked. He said, how is the human head the most worthless thing in society? Then he said, okay, uh, your lordship, give me some time to prove it. So he called one person and he said, take these three things, the head of a goat, the head of a chicken and a human head, a dead man's head and try and sell it in the market. <laughs> Next day he came back, chicken head had gone, goat head had gone, but the human head nobody was ready to buy. He said, I tried to give him for free, they didn't want it for free also. <laughs> so then he said, your lordship, this is why I said, the human head has no value. Only when the head is on the shoulder and there is life in that body is that head having the maximum value to decide and discriminate between what is right and what is wrong. When my grandfather passed away, Swami's words rang in my ears. When I saw his physical body being taken out of the house, I realized Swami's words that the first thing which will leave you will be your assets, your property, your money. His house which he built, in which he stayed and all the things that he gathered. His body left that and he moved on. When we went for the cremation, it stuck to me the second thing which Swami said. Your relatives, friends and family members will be able to come with you only till the cremation ground. And that's where we left him and came back. Swami said, only one thing goes with you. And that is the good and bad deeds that you have done in this life. So invest your total time in that particular purpose. The Sadasai Seva organization has been given only for this purpose. To give us the opportunity to progress in our spiritual path. There is no other purpose of the Sadasai organization in Swami's own words. The Sadasai organization is a great favor by Swami for like-minded sadhakas like you and me to progress in our spiritual path. And any opportunity we get to serve here as we are celebrating the Golden Jubilee is only to further our own spiritual progress. All this is fine.
Swami has said so many things and we just realized that all of these things are also mentioned in other scriptures. So why do you think Swami came? Already is there in Gita, Quran, Bible and all of them. All these Upanishads and all the prophets of all times have come and said that. Then why do you think Swami came? Dr. Hislo asked the same question to Swami. A seniority of his level is required to ask this question. Swami, all that you are saying is fine. But why did you come? What is the purpose of your avatar? Swami narrated this story. It is there in conversations of with Sri Satya Sai uh, in that book. Swami said, There was this herd of sheep. It was travelling in the jungle. And in that jungle, a small cub, tiger cub, got lost. And it joined this herd of sheep. And it was so small, it didn't know anything, so it silently started following the sheep, it got lost in that. And it started growing in the sheep, uh, in the herd of sheep. It became a full-fledged tiger over the next few years, but still it was behaving like a sheep. It did not have any tiger-like tendencies, it had sheep-like tendencies. And in that, once a tiger attacked that particular herd, and the tiger saw that while the sheep is running, there is another tiger in the herd who is also running away from this tiger. So this tiger was wondering what's wrong, that the tiger was also bleating instead of roaring. So this tiger didn't catch the sheep, it caught hold of that other tiger. And he started pleading, please leave me, leave me, I have not done anything, I want to go. So this tiger said, nothing doing, you come with me. He took the tiger, the, the, the sheep tiger and himself and went to a pond. And there in the pond, it showed the tiger, the sheep tiger its face and it showed its own face and he said, see, don't you and I have the same face? He said, yes. And the tiger roared and said, see, I can roar. Why don't you roar? And this tiger for the first time learned that you can roar because you are a tiger. So he roared and that's when the sheep tiger realized that in reality, it's not a sheep, it's a tiger. Swami said, that is the job of the avatar. I have come into this world to live in your midst, to show that the herd sheep mentality that you are following, thinking that all of us are human beings is wrong. I have lived a divine life to show you that we are all divine. I am roaring day in and day out to communicate to you that you all are all capable of roaring. Assert your divinity, as the Kathopanishad says, Uttishta Jagrata Prappe Varani Bodhita Awake, rise, rest not till the goal is achieved. That is the goal which every individual has. Because we are not human beings heading towards a spiritual destiny. We are spiritual beings leading a human existence. That is the difference between the message of the avatar which he wants us to understand. I'd like to come end with just one last story I have extended by five minutes. And that story is how do we go ahead? There are some things I'll share tomorrow. Uh, uh, the, the organizers have been kind enough to make me a part of the panel discussion, so I'll use some of that time to go ahead with what I wanted to share. But just one last story. All this is fine. We all understand this, and I shared this yesterday with the Ravais, but I think it should be known to the larger audience. All this is fine, but it is so difficult, isn't it? Love all, serve all, help ever, heart never. Help ever, we can hardly help sometimes. Hurt never impossible. At home only impossible. How do we do it outside? And this question was asked by one of our teachers to Swami in the interview room, group interview. He said, Swami, you say all these things, it is so easy for you to say, but it is so difficult for you to do, for us to do. What is the way out? Swami said, yes, correct. So then asked, Swami asked the student, Swami said, how long did you take to learn to walk? So the student said, Swami, here, here and now? He said, yes. How many times did you fall? So many times. Who helped you, Mommy? Mommy held your hand, then slowly she left your hand, she said, come, come, and used to move closer to Mommy, you pick up walking that way. Yes, how much time did you learn to talk? Three years. How much time did you learn to write? Five, six years. How much time did you hear take to finish a graduation degree? Twenty-two years. What is the objective? Degree. In the, today's world, objective of degree, get a job, lead a comfortable life. Swami did some sense. For all of this, you have put in so much of effort and you are aspiring for the highest thing, for God's grace, for the spiritual life and for attaining the highest, which is merchants with God Himself. How much more do you need to put an effort?
effort into it in order to achieve it. Correct? Then Swami said, but it is very easy. You know how to do it? Swami said, one word, practice. Writing practice for good handwriting. Now we have computer, but still we have to sign our name. So digital signature also requires signing, right? <laughs> Speaking practice, singing practice, dancing practice, drama practice. Everything is practice on this. Similarly, spirituality is also practice, practice, practice. The word in Sanskrit is abhyasa, practice. If you practice today, you will reach there someday. But if you don't start practicing, you will never reach that day. We hail all the maestros of all the sports, whether it is Tendulkar in cricket or MS Balakshmi in Carnatic music or even Amitabh Bachchan in the cinema field. But do you know how much practice they have put in to master that field? Day in and day out, even MS used to practice four to five hours every single day. Uh, Eskumar brother will share that. You will have to practice to master the field. You have to practice to go ahead on the path of spirituality. Our greatest good fortune is that love is our source, love is our path, and love is our goal. The whole story ends in one photograph. We have come from him, we are with him, we have to go back to him. Only thing is, we have to continuously stick to him within thought, word and deed. I pray to Bhagawan to shower his blessings on all of us so that we are able to make the maximum use of this human life. It is said that human life is meant only for two things. Atmano moksha from It is meant for self-emancipation and for welfare to society. This is the only two-fold agenda with which we are born. Everything else is only a means to achieve this agenda. So let us get geared up as we celebrate 40 years of this retreat, 50 years of the organization and 90 years of Swami Zavatar. Let's gear up to make our lives so very meaningful that we can make our lives His message. Jai Sai. for such a beautiful way to explain divine love, giving us five distinct themes and not only that, putting in practical tips on how we could practice the value of divine love. So thank you, that was really beautiful and enlightening and I think it has really motivated all of us to love all, serve all, hurt ever, hurt never and be on that path. So on behalf of all of us present here,